Hey, Village Church, welcome again to our service online. And before we continue into our service and I share a leadership update, let me pray. Lord, we ask in this service that you would be glorified, that our hearts would be caught up in a sense of worship and adoration of you, and that we truly would see how the gospel transforms every aspect of our lives. Draw us deeper into you that we might be more effective for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. And Village Church, just by way of sharing an update with you as we continue through this uh, historical moment, I just want to remind us of who God is. God is our sovereign redeemer. And if God's our sovereign redeemer, do you know what that means? It means he is in control. He's not pacing heaven. He's not anxious. God never has a sleepless night where he's turning and tossing. God is never concerned. He's always in perfect control. And if that is true, that gives us as Christians the ability to be patient, peaceful, kind, understanding, compassionate to those inside the church and those outside the church. And also what that does, it produces us in a heart not to try to navigate through this season out of a desire to either go fast or to go slow, but it produces a heart in us to be wise, to think through what is the wisest decision for this historical moment that we find ourselves in. And we remember that because he's our sovereign redeemer. But God is not only sovereign, he's also redeemer. And what that means is God is constantly in the business of recycling what is bad and making something good. He's constantly taking what is broken and fixing it. What Satan meant for evil, God turns around for good. All things work together for good in the sense that all things bring about an opportunity to conform us into the image of Christ. And we need to remember this truth in this coronavirus season because everything has been disrupted, yet we have a gospel opportunity. And God often uses disruptive times in and through them to do his work. Here's a list throughout history. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, a persecution scatter, scatters the church, yet the church grows. The gospel advances. We see all throughout history, in the mid-250s AD, there was a persecution and plague that hit Carthage. Christians ran toward the problem, not away from it, and the gospel grew. We see in the 1950s, Christian missionaries were kicked out of China. And when the world thought, how is the gospel going to advance in the country of China? We see, even though all the missionaries were kicked out, over the course of only a few decades, the number of Christians went from under a million to over 70 million and is still projected to climb. Christianity is exploding in the global south and in Asia. We see also in the Middle Eastern world, a world that is being turned upside down by war and refugees and displacement of people, yet at the same time, listen to this, there have been more Muslims coming to Christ in the past 15 years than the past 15 centuries combined. After 9-11, churches all throughout our nation, especially in New York, saw a surge of growth. Why? Because when you couple great need with a great Savior, you find growth. And Village Church is no surprise that in this coronavirus season, we find people who are anxious, troubled, concerned, fearful. And we have what they need. We have the gospel. And that's why we think it's so important at this moment in our history of our nation, in this moment in the history of our church, that we lean into what we are calling the Village Church Gatherings. This is groups of 10 people or less who are coming together all throughout the week to worship God together, to share life together in discipleship, and to love our neighbors together. In Village Church, I want you to do two things. I want you first and foremost to pray. I need you to pray and ask God to what extent can I be a part of the work that you are doing in this world Pray about if you can be a facilitator, excellent. If you can be a participant, excellent. If you can be a champion of this season and this ministry initiative, excellent. Please do as we seek to advance the gospel in and through the ministry of Village Church. And then I need you to do another thing. I need you to go to the website, 
check out what are the Village Church gatherings, read more information, and if you're ready to jump in, check out the form that will be available this Sunday to sign up, to plug in, to get engaged, to be a part of what God is doing, because this is a wave that I want us to catch. And I think we truly can be one church scattered together. And I think we could do it well in such a way that the gospel advances through this season. And I think we could do it through the village church gatherings. Won't you pray about it? Consider it. Read more information about it. And may we all see how God moves over the weeks and months to come. Now, feel free to check out this video that we are going to show of honoring our graduates. Thank you.
Let's pray. Father, as we turn to your word, we ask, as we always do, Lord, that you would work in and through the preaching of your word. Lord, that we would be encouraged where we need encouragement, comfort where we need, where we need comfort. Lord, would you sharpen us and embolden us, give us courage and strength to do your work and to do your will in this world and in our lives. And Father, we understand that when we come to your word, you've got to illuminate it in our hearts, that you would make it clear that your word truly would transform us. So Father, we commit ourselves to you. I commit myself to you. Guide my words. that They might glorify you. Guide our thoughts that we might honor you and change our lives, that we would look more like you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking today, continuing in this series uh, through the book of Colossians entitled, Christ Changes Everything. And we will see just how pervasive his transformative, redeeming power truly gets in this passage. And today we're looking at specifically Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 22 all the way through Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. This is what God's word says. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, verse 1, chapter 4. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Well, there are some passages in the Bible that are confusing. It may be confusing for a variety of different reasons. Some passages in the Bible are confusing because it uses theological words that we don't use in everyday speech, and they're just hard to understand. There are other passages in the Bible that are confusing because of where we find ourselves at this moment in history. And I think this is one of those passages that if you have read this passage before, or even as you read it now, some of you, as I read, especially that first verse, let me read it again, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Some of you might have heard that, and if you're honest with yourself, it's confusing at least, but perhaps deeply troubling and offensive, and you might have bristled at that passage at, at most. And I pray, I think, as we continue through this passage, even today in this message, whether there's um, anger in your heart, confusion in your heart, questions in your heart, asking, what is this passage saying? I pray, and I think by the end of this message, that which is unclear or foggy will be made clear, and the gospel will come through. So let me first say what this passage is not saying. <laughs> What this passage is not saying, or what this passage is not endorsing, it is not endorsing institutional slavery. Let me be very, very, very clear. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, is not endorsing or perpetuating or even being uh, passive toward institutional slavery. In fact, the opposite is quite true, and we'll see that as we continue through this message. But let me look, let me read one more time, verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, the ESV gets this translation right. Uh, there might be other translations that you read that actually reads slaves. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, I'm going to bring you deep. The Greek word here is doulos. And depending on the context, depending on what the passage is talking about, that word doulos, that Greek original word, can be translated either slave or servant or bondservant. And in this passage, in this context, in Colossians chapter 3, 
Bondservant is the best way to translate that word. Why? Because this passage is more so describing what we would know as indentured servitude and not describing what we would know in terms of the transatlantic slave trade. Because when we read this passage and we read, slaves obey everything, those who are your earthly masters, it is hard or impossible for us as 21st century Americans who are post-1619 transatlantic slaves trade to not hear the word slave and have our minds filled with, with chains filled with images of, of kidnapping people from Africa and bringing them across the ocean to the Western world. We, we can't help but our minds be filled with ships and boats full of people treated and considered as property and utilized for their work and discarded or even killed or abused or hurt. But this passage is not talking about that. It's talking about what we would more so know as indentured servitude. So can I say again, this passage is not endorsing either institutional slavery, as we historically know it from 1619 when it touched the shores of America, all the way up through in its ripple effects and implications that we see even to this present week, that this is not endorsing the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade. It's not endorsing the ripple effects that we see through the Jim Crow South, it's not endorsing the ripple effects that we see in terror lynchings. It's not endorsing the ripple effects that we see that have touched the lives and the people of people like Walter McMillan or Emmett Till or Laquan McDonald or Ahmaud Arbery or many, many, many more. This passage is not saying that. And because we come to this passage, and this can be a hard and confusing one, again, because the cultural world of the first century and our world as 21st century Americans are very different, that when the word bondservant would have been said in the first century, it would have under, been understood more appropriately to what the Bible is talking about. And we can misunderstand that with our 21st century American years when we read this verse. And I want to be very quick to actually offer an apology, and this is why. Because I represent a, a category of teachers or people who are tasked with the job of stewarding God's word well and teaching and declaring God's word fearlessly and courageously and not saying any more than the Bible is saying and not saying any less than the Bible is saying. And this is a passage that has been misunderstood and mishandled throughout history. It's been a passage, quite frankly, that's been abused, and I want to offer, because it's been historically misunderstood or even historically abused, I want to offer a historic apology. And I also want to mourn and lament and shed tears with you. And I know this topic touches home for many of you, as it also does for me. As many of you know, I most recently came before Village Church where I served as an assistant pastor at Judson Baptist Church in Oak Park, right on the west side of Chicago and into the early or, or the near western suburb of Oak Park. I love that church. Uh, it's a multicultural church, but predominantly African-American. Uh, I myself have an African-American nephew. Obviously, I am not African-American, but my brothers and sisters in the faith come to this passage and they come heavy of heart, reading a passage like this, and it almost makes them bristle, as I've been told by many. And I want to mourn with you, I want to lament with you for the times that this passage has been abused to either stay passive toward institutional slavery itself or the ripple effects that we see even to this present day. And I'm here to tell you what Colossians chapter 3 in verse 22 is describing, bond servants, obeying everything your earthly masters, what this passage is saying, and what, when, what we think of when we hear the word slavery in the transatlantic institutional slave trade, this is not that. I cannot make this any more clear. This passage is not endorsing institutional slavery or its ripple effects. This is, quite frankly, not 
that. And I have 28 points to show you and to tell you if you are not yet convinced. Look at what not only this passage says, but what the entire Bible says as we compare it to what we know as Americans post-1619 of institutional slavery. Look at the comparison. See how different Scripture truly is to what we know in our American history. Under institutional slavery, people were stripped of dignity, or institutional slavery stripped dignity from the person by seeing slaves as property. But Scripture infuses dignity to the person by seeing bondservants as family. Institutional slavery called people to tremble and serve and offer full allegiances to man as Lord, but Scripture calls people to revere and serve and offer full allegiance to Christ as Lord. Institutional slavery heightened human power since man is considered Lord, but Scripture lessens human's power since Christ is Lord. Institutional slavery cheapened personhood and identity by considering slaves three-fifths a person. But Scripture honors personhood and identity since people have inherent worth and dignity in Christ. Seeing themselves as Lord under institutional slavery, a slave owner's power was unbridled and could not be challenged. But according to Scripture, since Christ is Lord, human power is relative and can be challenged. It can be spoken into. Under their own lordship and in institutional slavery, slave owners treated slaves however they wanted. But under Christ's lordship, according to Scripture, masters are commanded by God to treat their bond service with justice. Under their own lordship, slave owners showed favoritism and unequal treatment. But under Christ's lordship, masters are commanded to treat their bond servants fairly and with equity. Slaves had no right to an inheritance, and slaves were seen as property and not family, according to slavery. But Scripture says believers are heirs to an inheritance from the Lord, since they are seen as God's beloved family. Institutional slavery highlights the difference between slave and free as people of unequal value and worth. But Scripture highlights the equality between slave and free as persons of equal value and worth, bearing the image of God. Trading slaves was merely considered an economic transaction and under slavery, but trading slaves is considered a sinful transaction according to the Bible. Kidnapping, according to slaves, was commonplace, but kidnapping is considered a sin according to Scripture. Murdering slaves was considered commonplace and a mere loss of property, but murder is considered a sin and a loss of life according to the Bible. Institutional slavery targeted and devalued people based on skin color and ethnicity, but the Bible honors and values and shows the dignity and worth of all ethnicities, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. Under institutional slavery, we see that physical and sexual abuse was used as a means of control, but the Bible confronts physical and sexual abuse, seeing it as sin. And that is a very short list of 28 things to show that what the Bible says is not what we think of in terms of the transatlantic slave trade. So that when we read this verse, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, it is not endorsing or perpetuating slavery or its ripple effects to this day actually is doing quite the opposite. It's a domino that leads to the ultimate demise and ultimate undoing of slavery, past, present, or future, and its implications that we are living in, in this very week, in our moment of American history. That when you take the Bible, when you take what God's Word says, even in Colossians 3, 22 and following, especially there, and all throughout the rest of Scripture, when you take the message of Scripture, and when you take the gospel itself, and you put those into a heart of transformed people, Christians who are saved by God, who care about the world, you're going to see not, not sin perpetuated, but sin brought to its demise. You're going to start to see people like the Brian Stevensons of our age, of our time. You're going to start to see people like the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s of a generation past. You're going to start to see people like the William Wilberforce's of Europe. You're going to start to see people all the way back as early as the Gregory of Nyssa's in the 300s AD, who was one voice amongst many, many, many throughout history that looked at the Bible 
and looked at the gospel and looked at slavery and said, you cannot reconcile the two. And not only can you not reconcile the two, but where the gospel goes, where God's word goes, and where Christians who have been transformed by God's grace and who care about the world, where they go, slavery and the ripple effect from slavery dies out. And we see God's redeeming, transformative power that where the gospel goes, what is wrong is made right. That what is broken is, we work at it to fix it. That when we see something sad, we mourn with those who mourn. We cry with those who cry. And even as I was preparing for this message this week, in light of recent events, I shed tears in my office. In light of the real lived implications of what we are seeing, the need is so great. But the gospel is, is a powerful resource that can not only transform our hearts, but it motivates us to want to go out in our world and take what is wrong and make it right. So can I be clear again, over and over and over, that when we read Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 and following, this is not endorsing in any way slavery or its ripple effects. We've spent some time here. You might be wondering, well, then what is it saying? <laughs> what is Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 and following talking about? How do we apply it to our lives? What does it look like in the day in, day out life that we all experience and live? Well, apart from the implications we just spoke about in terms of a pursuit of making what is wrong right and mourning with those who mourn, this passage is talking about how the gospel transforms our work. It's talking about the workplace. It's talking about your career. It's talking about your job. Whether it's a part-time job or an hourly job or you're, if you're on a salary, whatever it is, the gospel transforms our work, our career. And it says first and foremost to what we know now in 21st century America, what we would refer to as employees, the gospel says work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. This passage says, work for the Lord. Look at what it says in these following verses. Verses 23 and following. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And what this passage is saying is, whether you build bridges or you build budgets or whether you change diapers or whether you sweep floors or whether you take cavities out or whether you send emails, no matter what you do for your job and your career, do it for the Lord. Work for God. Work for Him. And when we say that Christ truly does change everything, see how specific this gets. This gets down to our nine to five. This is get, gets down to what we do after we clock in and what we do before we clock out at the end of the day. The gospel transforms the very work and career that we put our hands to, whatever that might be. And we see in this passage, the gospel does many things. This, and we could go on and on about this, but just a few things to cover from this text. The gospel changes our motives for our work. The gospel gives us a greater meaning for our work. And the gospel gives us generous hearts from our work. Let's look at how some of these play out. Look at what it says again, verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Notice how many times the Lord is mentioned. The Lord, verse 23. Lord Christ, verse 24. All the way through, Master in heaven, chapter 4, verse 1. We have a Lord and it is Christ. And what that does is the Lordship of Christ guards and keeps our hearts from the selfish tendency of underworking. This is the tendency that sometimes we have that creeps into our hearts that says stuff like, I'll work when I'm seen. Or it's the selfish, underworking heart disposition that says, hey, look, uh-oh, the boss is coming. Quick, everyone get back to work. Or that kind of scolds and shames our coworkers and says, hey, don't work so hard. You're making me look bad. It's this selfish tendency of underwork. But see how God's word keeps us from that and guards us from that and protects us from that. Why? Because our ultimate boss, our ultimate Lord is Christ himself. 
that we don't ultimately work for our earthly boss, we ultimately work for God through our earthly boss or through our earthly overseers. And because Christ is Lord, and because we work for him, and because he is with us always, there's never a moment that God doesn't see us. There's never a moment that God is somehow away from us, but then he comes into the room and then we start to get back to work and get uh, busy in what we are supposed to do in our jobs. God's always with us. And so it helps curb and protect us from the selfish motive and desire of underworking, saying, I work when I'm seen. But also notice how the gospel keeps us from the flip side of this coin. A similar selfish tendency of not underworking, but overworking. Not saying, I work when I'm seen, but saying, I work so I'm seen. And this is ironically just the flip side of the same selfish coin. The, the focus is still on me. It's, it's not on how I can benefit others. It's not how I can serve the world or glorify God through my work. It's all about me, how much I want to underwork or overwork. But the overwork tendency, I work so I'm seen, is a desire for self-justification. It's a desire to be seen by an employer. It's a desire to be seen by those of power and influence. It's this anxious place of the heart that absolutely burns the candle at both ends and, and ebbs in and out of dangerous workaholic tendencies, all under the desire to tell myself or tell those around me that I'm valuable and my work matters and I have purpose and I, mean it, and I have meaning and I want to be seen and acknowledged and validated by someone of power and of influence. And you know what protects us from that? The gospel of grace. If we are justified by grace, do you know what that means? That we stand before God, not based on our own performance, but based on Christ's performance. We don't work for God's approval. We work from God's approval. Why? Because we've been justified. We've been made not right, not because we've proved ourselves as the hardest working people, but because Christ has saved us. And our salvation is purely by grace. That it's, it's given, it's not earned. It's received and not achieved. Do you see what this does to our work ethic? Do you see what it does to how we see our career? We will be guarded. Our hearts will be protected. Our motives will change. And we will no longer say, I work when I'm seen or I work so I'm seen. But rather we will say something like, I work so God is seen. And this is the new meaning that the gospel gives to our career and our work. Look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. In verse, going back, one verse 23, one more time again that we, whatever we do, we work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. That ultimately the gospel means that when you go to work, whatever your work might be, again, pulling cavities, removing a tumor, building a bridge, building a chair, sending emails, whatever it is, you actually work through your employer, through your boss, and you work for the Lord. That he is ultimately the one to whom our work is ultimately directed. And then do you see what that does to your work? That when you go to your job in the morning or late at night or whenever you work, you are actually going to worship. That one of the expressions of our work in this world is an expression of gratitude and our, our, our work in response to who God is and what he's done. Our Lord, Jesus Christ, as Colossians shows us, made everything. God himself is a creator God. He made everything. And then in the book of Genesis, it shows that God tasks us to steward the world, to steward creation, and to keep it, and to subdue it. So that when you take trash out of the bag and put it in the dumpster, when you take a dumpster and put it in the truck, and when you take the truck to the to, to the, to the, uh, to the I'm, I'm losing the word, to the place where you leave it, <laughs> that is an expression of our stewardship of God's creation, that we in some ways reflect our creator, God. And that is an expression of his design in us and through us, that we bear his image, we look like him, and we glorify God through our work. So don't go to work 
as an opportunity to make yourself look good. Go to work as an opportunity to make God look good. That you would work to glorify him. See how pervasive the gospel is. It transforms our motives. It gives us a greater meaning that we work for God. And finally, it gives us a generous heart. It makes us want to give instead of get. Look at what this verse says, this next verse. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That if we ultimately receive an inheritance from God, if we are saved by grace from the overflow and the riches and the abundance of God's grace, do you know what that means? That if God has been generous with us, we can be generous to others. We can be generous with our time. We can be generous with the gifts and abilities God has given us. We can be generous with, with the money God has given to us to steward that we no longer come to our work to say things like, I work so that I can get. Rather, we say, I work so that I can give. That your clients are not there as, as people from whom you can get their money. Your clients are there as people uh, to whom you can give your expertise and your knowledge and your skill or whatever you offer to them. There's a Christian comedian that in his testimony, in his journey, and in his career, there was a turning point that for a while in his career, this comedian specifically thought and said in his heart, I'm doing Christian comedy to get people to laugh. A shift took place in his career, and he said, I'm no longer doing comedy to get people to laugh. I'm doing comedy in order to give others an opportunity to laugh. That's one small example in one specific field of how the gospel changes our hearts to a generous heart. One that says, I'm not here to make money from you. I'm here to give my expertise and knowledge and what I have for you. That our work itself becomes an expression of our ability to glorify God and our ability to bless and serve the world. So that when you sell a car, for example, you're not just trying to get money. You're trying to give people the means to get from point A to point B to go on with their life. And whatever money God does give you, it's there to provide the needs for yourself, for your family, and, and to be generous to those around you. And this is just a very short list. It, the gospel changes our motives for work, not underworking or overworking. The gospel gives us a greater meaning for our work. It's not for an earthly boss. It's not for us. It's for God. And the gospel produces a generous heart in us and through us so that when we come to work, we're here to work for the Lord, for his glory, for his renown, that he might be made big through what we do. This passage opens by talking mostly to what we would call employees, to, to workers. But this passage also speaks into overseers, bosses, those who have responsibility and influence over people or organizations or companies. And what God's word says to them, God's word says to you who are listening, if you have any measure of oversight over anyone, God says to you, oversee and do it under the Lord. Oversee under the Lord. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And whether you find yourself overseeing two employees or 20,000 employees, whatever measure of oversight God has given you in your work, whether you uh, oversee a classroom of maybe 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 students, or whether you oversee a school, or whether you oversee a, a whole network of, of, of schools, whether you oversee... Um, a group of employers or bosses, or whether you yourself are a boss or you're your own boss, what God's word is saying to you is oversee. Do the work of leadership. Make wise decisions. Take responsibility. Lead. Oversee. But do it under the lordship of Christ. Because in this passage, in this section of the book of Colossians, 
the reality that Christ is Lord is absolutely saturated every single verse in this portion. As we look at the relationship between husband and wife, parent and child, boss and employee, we have to see it in light of the reality that Christ is Lord. Because there can be a subtle, sinful tendency for those who I'm speaking to, if you have any measure of oversight, again, whether that's over a small organization or company or business or whatever, or a huge one, there's a sinful tendency that we can creep into our hearts that starts to subtly think, you know, I'm Lord. The buck stops at me. I make the big decisions. Everyone reports to me. And there's this subtle, self-inflating pride that can creep into our sinful human hearts. The Lordship of Christ pops a hole in, in that balloon and deflates it because Christ come, comes along and says, I am Lord. I am King. The buck stops at me. I call the shots. So that any oversight that we do have of a company or organization is under the Lordship of Christ. And what that does for overseers or any of you in any level of leadership, what it does for you is it changes your heart and gives you a humility of heart. And it also shapes your integrity. It not only changes us from the inside, our humility, but it also changes what we do, how we go about leading and making decisions and taking uh, um, responsibility over the people or organizations that we lead. Look at again this verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And if we have a master in heaven, do you know what that means? And I don't care if you're a CEO of a company of 20,000 or a king or prime minister or president of a country, all of us are mid-management under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And you know what that does? It makes us humble. It reminds us that the buck doesn't ultimately stop at us. We are under God's authority, the lordship of Christ. And that keeps us humble. It keeps the sinful tendency of thinking that we're kind of a big deal or we have power or we have authority. It helps curb that. And it changes that from a prideful thing to a responsibility thing. That we have to be humble in this. Why? Because Christ is Lord. But not only does that make us humble in heart, it also makes us integrous in what we do. It, it shapes how we go about business and making decisions. Once again, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, overseers, bosses, employee, employers, we could say, treat your bondservants justly and fairly. It helps us shape practices in any level of, of leadership and oversight that we have that pursue justice and equity in the sense that one of the spheres of influence in this world, in our lives, that we express the justice of God through our pursuit of justice is in the workplace. So that leaders, employers, bosses, one of the ways that you are an extension of God's justice in this world is to the extent that you pursue and seek and do justice in your workplace. That you treat people fairly. That you work toward best practices. That you work absolutely at least toward right practices. That you avoid ways of immorality. That you avoid... Um, that you avoid sinful tendencies that might increase your revenue, might increase your income, but does it through an immoral way. God's word protects us from that. Why? Because Christ is Lord. It keeps us humble. It makes us integrous. So that no matter what we do, no matter how much influence and power you might have on this earth, we see that we are still under the lordship of God, the one who has ultimate power and the one who is ultimately just toward us. So when we come to our work, our career, our job, this passage shows us that since Christ is Lord, work for the Lord. And since Christ is Lord, oversee under the Lord. That's what this passage is saying. That's what Colossians chapter 3, verses 20, 22 
through chapter 4, verse 1, is saying it's not an endorsement of institutional slavery nor the ripple effects that we see all the way up to this very week. Rather, it's showing us, it's, it's showing us how the gospel transforms our career and our work. It's showing us that if God is Lord, and He is, if Christ is Lord, and He is, so says Colossians, and all throughout the Bible, since Christ is Lord, work for the Lord and oversee under the Lord. And so says the internet, we spend around 90,000 hours of our life, which is kind of 10 years on the conservative side, maybe 13 years of our life on the ambitious side at work. That's a huge chunk of time. And that's way too big a slice of our life for us to not bring the gospel into it. For us to think that, I, yeah, I do my Christian stuff outside of work, but when I go to work, the gospel doesn't impact that area of my life. There's 90,000 hours of your life that you can bring the gospel into and scripture into and the implications of the gospel in your work so that you glorify God and so that you serve the world. So I want to encourage you to think through what you do for work. What fills your Monday through Friday? What fills your 40, 50, 60 hours of your week? And wrestle through this passage and ask, how can the gospel bring out the best? How can it give me selfless motives, not selfish motives? How can it give me new meaning? How can it make me generous? How can I treat my employees or those whom I have authority over? How can I treat them fairly and justly? And how can the gospel keep me humble of heart? And when you do that, we will see through the very work that we put our hands to, God is glorified and the world is helped. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you truly would do that. And Lord, I pray we talked about two very important things today. One cultural thing and one thing as it pertains to our work, our careers. And Lord, I just pause and lament with and, and soberly reflect on how deep and pervasive sin and depravity truly is. Lord, our world is broken and we are reminded of that in weeks like this week. Father, help us mourn with those who mourn. Help us to seek what is right. Help us to fix what is broken. Help us to be hands and feet who seek reconciliation in this world that through the church, through Christians, through believers, we might see measures of justice found so that one day, Father, when you come back and you make everything right, we will anticipate and we will see glimpses of that even in our life now. We pray for that, Lord. We also pray for our work, our careers. Strengthen us, Lord, in the work that we put our hands to. Use it for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. And we, of course, want to now, as we have been doing through this season, turn the worship liturgy over to you as families and as individuals to process through some of these topics, to continue the discussion. Also, to look at the chart that I read through and we went through very quickly, even in this message. Wrestle through these, pray through these, dialogue through these, so that the gospel might come through and Christ's love might shine through us to a world that desperately needs it. God bless. 